Hi everyone. This video will be beginning our second unit, which is on deductive logic. So let's get right to it. In this video, the, uh, the first video of this lecture, I'll be going into a bit more into a bit more detail about the notions of an argument and validity. These notions were introduced at the end of last week, and we'll see in a bit more detail how they work. Then in, this, in the next video, the second part of this lecture, we'll be talking about logical form and logical validity and the limits of our approach to logical form. So in this lecture, uh, there'll be many elements which are review from last week, but it's important that we understand them uh, clearly before we introduce symbolism. And we will be introducing, uh, introducing some symbolism as well uh, in this lecture and the next lecture of this week. Okay. So arguments and statements. So here is a precise definition of what an argument is for the purposes of this course. An argument is a collection of statements. One of the statements is the conclusion and the rest are premises. The premises are supposed to provide support for the conclusion. And we saw last week how there's two different types of support. There's inductive and deductive support. And in this unit, we'll be studying what it means for an argument to provide good deductive support. Another concept which is important, which we've already seen, but which I want to state precisely for you, is the idea of a, the standard form of an argument. So an argument is presented is presented in standard form when it, it is presented as a list with premises one to n in order and a conclusion at the end. So as I, as I just said, an argument is a collection of statements where it has a, a conclusion and a bunch of premises. So where the number of, of premises is n, to, to present the argument in standard form, you present the premises in a list from one to n uh, in that order. And then at the very end, you list the conclusion. So here's uh, the form of how to present an argument in standard form. So we have uh, the items on the list uh, premise one or P1 for short to PN and then C for conclusion. So we've already seen pre arguments presented in this way and we'll continue to do so. So as a bit of, as a bit of review, here is what arguments are not, or at least for the purposes of this course, this is not what we mean by an argument. So arguments in our sense are not debates, fights, quibbles, or quarrels between people. They are not even disagreements. Arguments for us are not things we do. Rather, they are abstract objects. That is, they are collections of statements. Now, of course, when we understand how to analyze arguments in our abstract sense, i.e. collections of statements where the premises support the conclusion, once we understand that, we can, of course, apply this understanding uh, to understand things people do when arguing. Okay, so, however, we're not, in this course, we're not directly concerned with what people do when they're debating or fighting. Instead, we're concerned with arguments in the abstract sense, i.e. as collections of statements. So we've already seen many examples of arguments and even looked at, uh, figured out whether or not they're valid. Um, but just as a bit of review, here is a couple of simple examples of arguments. So this first argument here, uh, the first premise is that stealing is wrong. The second premise is that if stealing is wrong, then no one should steal. And the conclusion is therefore uh, no one should steal. The second example is uh, another simple argument. 
So we say if prime is one, if Sally is home, then the lights are on, the lights are on, therefore Sally is home. Now, if we'd wanna present either of these arguments in standard form, we would simply make a list where and we'd put premise one or P1, stealing is wrong, P2, if stealing is wrong, then no one should steal, and then conclusion or C, therefore no one should steal. And we, we would do something similar for example two. So in our account of what an argument is, which we saw just a minute ago, which is that an argument is a collection of statements where some statements are the premises and one of them is the conclusion. So uh, we, of course, this definition of argument, which I just gave again, appeals to the idea of a statement. And what a statement is, is a sentence that can be either true or false. So the reason why in our definition of argument to return to it, the reason why we don't say that an argument is a collection of sentences is because there's many different types of sentences that are not good premises or conclusions. And that's because there's many sentences that are not possibly true or false. Whereas when we're presenting arguments, we want to make sure that all of the premises and the conclusion are sentences that can, can be true or false. And that's why we say that an argument is a collection of statements where a statement is a sentence that can be either true or false. So in a bit more detail, statements are declarative sentences as opposed, so the declarative sentence states something. For instance, when you say it is raining, this is in contrast to an interrogative sentence or a question. For instance, if you ask, is it raining? Okay, so there's in general, three different types of sentences. There's declarative sentences, there are interrogative sentences or questions, and finally there are imperative sentences or commands. And it's only declarative sentences that uh, can be statements that can be either true or false. You, you do not say that a question or a command is true or false. And so it's important that uh, statements are the building blocks of logic. So when we're concerned with logic, especially deductive logic, we're concerned with truth because we're concerned with when the truth of certain sentences entails the truth of other ones. So therefore, it's essential that the sentences which we're concerned with are ones for which truth or falsity apply. And that's why statements are the building blocks of logic. Now, a quick note, which is that throughout this course, I might be a bit loose with terminology, and I, instead of using the word statement consistently, I might simply just use sentence or the word proposition. So if I talk about sentences in logic, I'm implicitly assuming that I'm talking about sentences which can be either true or false. And this notion of a proposition is a more technical notion in, in philosophy. And because this is just an introduction to logic class, I won't be going into the details of the notion of proposition, but I might end up using the word and it should just be, you should just treat it as a synonym for a statement. And similarly, if I talk of sentences, you should understand that I'm just using it implicitly for a sentence that can be either true or false, i.e. a statement. So here are some examples of statements. First, the statement, Brazil is in North America. This is a, a simple declarative sentence and it is stating something about the world. In this case, what it's stating is false, but it is nonetheless a statement because um, a statement is something that makes a claim that can be either true or false, which this does. Here's another statement. Broccoli is a good source of vitamin A. This is true, I think, um, but in any case, what's crucial is that this is another example of a simple statement about the way things are. Here's another one, goats eat cans. This it might be a strange thing to say. However, it's, you can recognize it as a statement about the way things are um, that might be either true or false. 
here is a more poetic statement, love is cruel. And though the things you're talking about here are a bit more abstract, um, love is a kind of more abstract thing than goats or broccoli or Brazil. But nonetheless, the statement love is cruel um, can be either true or false. Here are some examples of sentences that are not statements. So the question, what is the atomic weight of carbon? That question, that interrogative sentence is not a statement. It's not stating something that can be either true or false. Rather, it's asking for some information. The statement, the, not the statement, the sentence, let's go to the park today, is also not a statement. Rather, it's uh, an imperative or a request. So here, you're not stating something about the world. What you're doing is you're asking or requesting using an imperative sentence um, for someone uh, to go to the park with you. Here's another example of an imperative sentence, and this is a direction. So you might imagine your GPS or phone giving you this direction to get somewhere, saying, turn to the left at the next corner. This sentence is neither true nor false. It's not making a claim about how things are that can be either true or false. Rather, it's simply giving directions. Here is a kind of expressive utterance. You say, holy crap, let's say you've you know, fallen and hurt yourself, or you see something surprising. Um, and this is not, this utterance, holy crap, is not something, something that can be either true or false. Rather, you're just expressing uh, how you feel. So now that we've gotten clear on what arguments are and what the statements are that compose them, let us turn to the notion of validity and its companion notion soundness. So an argument is valid just in case if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be as well. Or equivalently, it's impossible for the premises to be true while the conclusion is false. So the important, the most important thing to realize about what it means for an argument to be valid is that the validity of an argument is independent of whether the premises and or conclusion are in fact true or false. All that matters for the validity of an argument is whether if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be as well. So some other terminology we'll use, which is instead of uh, talking about validity, are, is as follows. So when an argument is valid, we say, that we say that the premises entail or logically entail the conclusion. We also say that the conclusion follows uh, logically from the premises. Or finally, we'll, we can also say that the conclusion is a logical consequence of the premises. So all of these notions, so validity as well as entailment or following from or a logical consequence, all of these notions come to the same thing. And what they are come to is that is the idea that if the premises are true or on the assumption that the premises are true, the conclusion must be true as well. So hopefully in the problem in the quiz from last week, you had some practice identifying whether arguments were valid or not. And we'll continue this week in working through exercises like that. So in addition to whether an argument is valid, we can also ask whether an argument is sound. And what it means for an argument to be sound is that it is valid and all the premises are true. So 
To repeat, an argument is sound just in case it is valid and all the premises are true. Now the notion of soundness is important because if we know an argument is valid and we know all its premises are true, then we therefore know the conclusion of the argument is true. So a sound argument must have a true conclusion because it's valid and the premises are true. So there is a large group of arguments which are valid and these valid arguments are such that if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. However, not all valid arguments are ones in which the premises are actually true. And for this reason, just because an argument is valid, we don't know for sure that the conclusion is in fact true. All we know is that if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be. But sound arguments are arguments which are valid and for which all the premises are true. And so for sound arguments, we can be guaranteed that the conclusion is true. So let's go back to these simple example arguments from the beginning of this video. And let's just quickly ask whether they're valid. So with the first example, premise one, stealing is wrong. Premise two, if stealing is wrong, then no one should steal. Therefore, conclusion, no one should steal. Now, hopefully with the practice you had from last week, hopefully you can see quickly that this argument is valid. And in fact, this argument has a form of modus ponens. So we have as one of the premises, a conditional, so we say, if stealing is wrong, then no one should steal. And another premise, we have the assertion of the antecedent of the conditional, which is that we stealing is wrong. So if we have as one of the premises that if stealing is wrong, then no one should steal. And then if the other premise is that stealing is wrong, then we can infer validly that no one should steal. Now with our second example, we have the following argument. Premise one, if Sally is home, then the lights are on. Premise two, the lights are on. Therefore, conclusion, Sally is home. Now hopefully again, from the practice you've had, you can see how this argument is not valid. And in fact, this argument has a form of affirming the consequent and any argument which has that form is not valid. So in this case, we have a conditional, if Sally is home, then the lights are on. But the other premise is affirming the consequent of that conditional, and then attempting to infer the antecedent. However, just because it's true that if Sally is home, then the lights are on, that does not guarantee that there can't be other ways in which the lights can be on when Sally is not home. That is, perhaps Sally left and left, left her home, but left the lights on. So it can still be true that whenever she is home, she keeps the lights on. But nonetheless, there can be situations in which the lights are on, uh, but Sally is not home. And these two, nothing that these two premises say guarantee that those uh, situations don't exist. And that is why we cannot conclude validly from these two premises that Sally is home. Now, when I introduced the notion of soundness, I, I noted how if an argument is sound, then the conclusion must be true. And I noted how that means that a sound argument is in a sense better than a merely valid argument. So to return to our example one, this argument uh, that stealing is wrong, and if stealing is wrong, then no one should steal, therefore no one should steal, this argument, as we just saw, is valid. But in order to actually 
uh, use this to uh, conclude that in fact, no one should steal, it has to be the case that the two premises are in fact true. It has to be true that stealing is wrong. And it also has to be true that if stealing is wrong, then no one should steal. And if these two premises are in fact true, then because this argument is valid, we have that this argument is a sound argument. And then we can conclude that uh, no one should steal. And because, so because a sound argument is one which guarantees the truth of the uh, conclusion, we might think that uh, soundness captures what it means for something to be a good argument. That is, we might think, or well, we might have the hypothesis that an argument is good just in case it is sound. And for the purposes of studying uh, deductive logic in order to understand validity, which is a core part of soundness, this is a helpful hypothesis because it shows how the tools that we're using to study validity can help us construct good arguments. However, it's important to note, to note that, there, uh, that this hypothesis, even though it's helpful, it has uh, some important counterexamples. So here's one problem. So here I have a very simple argument. Uh, the first premise is that murder is wrong. And the conclusion is that murder is wrong. Now this uh, argument is definitely valid, okay, because if it's true that murder is wrong, then it must be true that murder is wrong. And furthermore, we can also suppose that it's in fact true that murder is wrong. So we can suppose that uh, this argument here is sound. However, this, even though this argument is sound, it, it doesn't seem like a very good argument. And that's because it seems like we're begging the question or we're providing, or we're providing a circular argument. So there are circular arguments that can be sound, but that doesn't mean that they're good arguments, okay? So this issue that some arguments are circular or beg the question um, is worth keeping in mind when we're studying validity when, and when, when we want to eventually apply it to actual arguments. Here's another problem. Consider the following argument, premise one. If general relativity theory, this is a theory in physics, so if this theory is true, then there are black holes. And there are black holes, therefore, general relativity theory is true. So this argument has the form of affirming the consequence, which is the same as the form of this argument, uh, example two. So this argument is not valid. Therefore, it's also not sound. However, this argument seems, in a sense, pretty good. And so here's a way of understanding this argument. First, the first premise is saying that general, general re relativity theory predicts that there should be black holes. And so when people discover that there are, in fact, black holes, that provided uh, support or confirmation of the theory. And so people concluded that the theory should be true, or at least this observation provided support for believing the theory is true. Now, if all we cared about was deductive validity, then we would not be able to make sense of how this is actually a pretty good inference. And in fact, in unit three, when we look at probability theory, we will be able to see how actually many arguments which are uh, not deductively valid are nonetheless good. So here's a final example of an argument I want to work through with you. And as a way of motivating what the special notion of validity is that we will be studying with the help of our formal logic. So the, here I have an argument in standard form. So I have premise one or P1, John is a bachelor. 
And the conclusion is that John is unmarried. Now I want what I want you to ask yourself, is this argument valid? So it certainly does seem that it's impossible for the premises to be true while the conclusion is false. So assuming that John is a bachelor, it seems like it must be the case that he's unmarried. But this, this is a bit tricky here because the validity here relies on us knowing the meaning of the word bachelor. So assuming that John is a bachelor and given that we understand what it means for someone to be a bachelor, um, it must be the case that they're unmarried. But it's crucial here that we appeal to our understanding of what it means for someone to be a bachelor. But when we think about validity in the sense that will concern us, we're, we're gonna be concerned with formal validity. And, we're, and so we'll be able to apply the tools of formal logic. So I want you to consider this argument here, argument six. So here again, I have an argument in standard form. And in this case, there's two premises. Premise one, John is a bachelor. Premise two, all bachelors are unmarried. Conclusion, John is unmarried. So this argument is kind of similar to the argument from before. However, this time, even if you don't know the meaning of the words involved, you can still tell that the argument is valid. So we can see this because we can give another argument of the same form where we replace words that we understand with random words or nonsense words. So in argument seven, we have an argument of the exact same form as argument six, but we've put in some nonsense words to replace bachelor and unmarried. So in argument seven, we have John is a bleep, all bleeps are bloop, therefore John is bloop. So even though we have no idea what it means for something to be a bleep or bloop, we can still see how this argument is valid. If it's true that John is a bleep and all bleeps are bloop, then it must be the case that John is bloop. So here, the validity of argument six and argument seven does not depend on the meanings of the words involved. It depends rather uh, merely on the form of the argument, the way these words are put together, so to speak. Whereas in argument five, the validity of this argument depends on us understanding what it means for John to be a bachelor. And so, the notion of validity will not capture the sense in which argument five is valid. Rather, the notion of validity we will study is gonna capture how certain arguments are valid in virtue of their form. So in the next video, of the, the next part of this lecture, in the next video, I'll talk a bit more about logical form and uh, formal validity.